Would you like another tool to help you with your genetic genealogy? Well, MyHeritage has it with their genetic groups, and I'm going to go over that today. To understand what genetic groups are, you need to know that they involve DNA, but they also involve trees. And you may be thinking, well, don't they have the theory of family relativity for that? And yeah, the theory for family relativity is really looking at one person based off of how you're related to a bunch of other people. The genetic groups is doing something similar except with a group as opposed to a single person. So it's taking the DNA of people that match each other and it's looking at the trees to see, well, what common places were they from? So for instance, what we're trying to see is we're trying to see maybe a migration route or a cluster of people that were from a certain area and not necessarily trying to pinpoint a certain ancestor from that. So let me go over the genetic groups and how they are related to both the ethnicity as well as some other things and how you might be able to use them in your genealogy. You can find the genetic groups on the DNA page. If you look at overview, there is the ethnicities. One of the things that's going to tell you is you have X number of ethnicities and a number of genetic groups. I happen to have 12 genetic groups. So I'm going to go over to the full estimate to see the whole genetic groups. And here you can see on this map, the colored regions are the ethnicities that they have shown for me. Let's see if I can get that other one there, uh, the English one. So I have English, I have Irish, Scotch, Welsh, Finnish, and Middle Eastern. Then the dark line, and there's basically all gray areas, are your genetic groups. Now, these genetic groups are loosely linked to certain ethnicities, but as we go through, you'll see that there's lots of overlap between all of these different things. So let's start uh, with the confidence level that's shown right over here. You have a high, medium, and a low confidence level. Now, if you want to understand what this means, they have a little explanation. Basically, the groups, there's 2,100, more than 2,100, all across the world. And if you have a high confidence level, that's a strong indication that you are a member of that genetic group. A lower confidence level is less conclusive, but it doesn't mean that you're not. So as with many things, this is the case where, hey, start your research with the high confidence levels and then go down from there. You can see of my genetic groups, I have two high confidence level groups. I have the England number 13, which we'll go over here in a second. And I have the Mormons in Utah and Idaho, which we'll go over, which I'm not going to worry about going over that one. Basically from my known genealogy, this is perfectly right. I have ancestors that were Mormons that migrated to Utah and Idaho area. And I also have ancestors that are from England. So let's focus on the England one here and see what it's showing us. When we click on that group, it can tell us a little bit about this. So for instance, this is English and some Scottish and Irish and their descendants in Australia, New Zealand, and United States and Canada. Now, how are these groups formed? Basically what MyHeritage did is they did a great big cluster analysis of all their members and they found these clusters of members that are related to many of the other people in that group. And then they looked in their trees to find what is the common places or place that these people have ancestors. So in this case, you can see, hey, there are 28,520 people in this big old cluster. And there was 12,000 of those that had family trees, which was great because from that 12,000 family trees, they basically traced it back to England. So all these people have migrated from England at, at some point in their, in their family history. Or they actually still, some of them stayed in England. Now you can go through and you can see where these different places, people are at now, 
So these are the members, where are they at? And you can see the common surnames as well as given names and then common ethnicities. So for instance, if I'm looking at the common surnames here, I might want to see more than just that. Let me expand to all of them. So I can see that the common surnames are Harris, Wright, Baker, Hill, Hall, Clark, Robinson, Green, King, and Turner. Now it just so happens, I think, and this, this is probably for some lines that are not ones that I researched specifically, but I believe I have some rights from England, um, probably that are part of this group, as well as a Robinson or two. I think those are the two that, that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm most likely have in that, in that group. Now you can also see where were people. There is a lot, it looks like, into Australia and New Zealand, and you can see that from this heat map. It's pretty big right over here as well as um, Canada, and then we can also see here in the United States. And finally, the common ethnicities of members of this group. Well, English, obviously, because it looks like this is representative of a group, groups of people that migrated from England to US and Canada and South Africa and Australia and New Zealand, but also Irish, Scotch, Welsh, which is right next to England. There's a lot of mixture within that. North and Western European, again, right across the channel, a lot of mixture. In fact, that's where a lot of the newer English DNA came from was the North and West Europeans and then Scandinavians. Scandinavians you're gonna find all over because the Vikings just went all over. So anywhere in Europe, they're going to be it. The other thing it has is it also has these related groups. Now these are other genetic groups that are similar or maybe related or there's a lot of crossover between that. And we'll talk about some of that crossover between that as well. But you can see there's, what, 10, 15 of these different groups that are related to this England 3 group. One of the things that I would say is, is how these are useful is particularly for people who don't know their parentage, adoptees, for instance. If you don't know your parentage, then for instance, the theory of family relativity is not gonna work at all for you because you need to have a family tree in order for that to work. Well, the nice thing about genetic groups, you don't have to have a family tree. Remember when I looked at this England, there was 28,000 people that were part of this group, but only 12,500 trees. So more than half of these people didn't have a tree attached but because of those 12,000 of us that do have a tree, they're fairly certain that this group was from England um, over a certain time period. So because of that, one of the things that you can look at on this map is not only your ethnicity results, but also where are your groups and where should you probably focus your research? Now, the first thing that I would look at is I would say, okay, the United States, since it's not Native American, these are all immigrant groups. So I can ignore those for right now and go back across the Atlantic Ocean to where the Middle East, the Finnish, and my English and Irish ethnicities are. And you'll notice that I actually have three groups that are overlaid primarily over the English side of things. And I don't have any genetic groups over Finland or the Middle East. Now, finish it saying I have 3.1%, Middle Eastern I says 1.4%. Those are really small percentages and I probably wouldn't worry about those. But in particular, if I didn't know any better, I don't have this group of people that are known to be from a certain area in Finland and the Middle East. So I'm not even gonna worry about those ethnicities and I can focus on these English and Irish and Scottish ethnicities primarily. And if I even just go to the high ones, really the one to focus on happens to be England. So let me focus on this England number 13 for a moment. And as we go to the heat map here, I can see that in England, it's scattered all about, and this is in the time period of 1900 to 1950. So this is where different events of people's lives happened in 1900 to 1950. Now, I have a great grandfather who is from Cornwall, England, down here in the little corner of England and he immigrated in 1912. So he immigrated in this time period. And what we can see as we go back, 
that I believe lines up with my genealogy is the heat map in that Cornwall area starts to get more dense as we go back in time. And that's because I have more and more ancestors back in time in that area, as well as these other people whose ancestors immigrated maybe in the 1850 to the 1950 time period. So if we go to 1800 to 1850 and we start to see that, hey, this part of Cornwall is even more of a heat map. And 1750 to 1800, well, this is the time period before a lot of that immigration happened. And you can see that most all of Cornwall is covered now in this heat map. And the same as we go further back in time. So basically what this is telling me is this group, particularly what I'm understanding from my ancestry from the Cornwall area, they all lived here in the 1700s. And by about 1800, this migration started to happen from this area to different places in the world, uh, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, the United States and Canada. And it lasted for 100 years, 150 years to the point where most of the people that were a part of this group are no longer living in England, as we can see, because it gets much smaller and smaller. And if we bring it up to the present day, we can actually pull up and see that, hey, there's just a few dots down here in England. And that's one of the things that I've actually found as my, as my family has gone back and, and tried to connect with people from this ancestral home of, of my great grandfather, there's very few of his relatives. And, and when I say relatives, I'm talking even second and third cousins who are still living there. Most, most of them have, have migrated out. And so that's one way where these genetic groups can be helpful is to start to focus your research if you don't know where your ancestors are from. Now, if you do know where your ancestors are from, then these might be helpful in seeing and connecting with other people that are similar to you. Now, you can't connect by a genetic group yet. So for instance, those 28,000 people in the England 13, I don't have access to you know, filter a list by them. I can only filter it by the ethnicity results so far. But maybe in the future, that will change. Before we continue, if you want to support our work, there's many ways that you can do that. In the description below, you will find links to show notes, to free guides, as well as our website. The most important thing you can do though is to share this video with your friends and be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. It's because of viewers like you that we continue to grow. Now, the other thing that I wanted to point out in these groups is the overlap, the amount of overlap. And in some cases, some of these groups might need to be merged, but maybe not. So if I'm looking right here at, and this is showing all the way down to low confidence. If I'm showing medium confidence, there's only two groups over here in the Eastern United States. And if I'm showing low confidence, there's looks like seven or eight groups um, here in the United States. And they all overlap. In fact, there's really this Southern group that is one and then all these others that are another, but there's enough overlap between it that there's this little sliver right in here between Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, out to Missouri that overlaps all of them. Now, this might be coincidence, but in my family lines that I know of that I've done research on, that is exactly the path, the migration path that my ancestors, many of them took. Starting out um, in Virginia, Maryland, Virginia area, and slowly moving westward as land was opened up in Kentucky and Tennessee and now in Missouri and eventually out to California. So I find it interesting that when I'm looking at the overlap, I have this little sliver of land here that almost exactly matches the route my ancestors, many of my ancestors took across the United States over a 300 year period. Now, I also happen to have ancestors that I know of all the way up here in, in New York, my Dutch ancestors that came over in the 1600s. And so that makes sense that there's um, plenty of that up there. 
And I mentioned about the, um, the Mormon pioneers out in Utah. I have not only people who crossed the plains with the Mormon pioneers, but also who later immigrated from England and elsewhere with that. Now with these overlaps, some of these overlaps are almost indistinguishable when we're just looking at them. So let's take a look at this, let's see here, Midwestern and Northeastern United States. Okay, it covers English, German, and some Irish, Scottish, Swiss, Dutch, French, and Scandinavian settlers. That's an awful lot. But I also have this Midwestern United States 9, which is almost the same area. And you'll notice English, German, some Swiss, Dutch, French, Irish, and Scottish settlers in the Midwestern United States. Now there's different numbers that make up these. And it is likely that there is a large population that really belongs to both of these groups because of the intermixing that went on between different populations that were coming over, but also just because it's hard to separate out DNA from 100, 200, 500 years ago in some of these cases with this. Now, most of my groups, as you're looking at them, are actually quite large. They cover large areas. Not all of the genetic groups are going to be this large. Let's go down to the bottom here and show all the available regions. This is all 2,100 groups. Now they're divided up by different ethnic groups. And I want to caution there with this is don't think that the genetic group has to be just contained within that ethnic group. There is lots of overlap as we will see. So let's go over to the, well, first off, the English group. There's 254 genetic groups for England and another 155 for Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. So really between the, the uh, British Isles there, 400, is that right? 400, more than 400 groups just from that. And that's really because most of the people that have tested have ancestry from there. And so the more, most data available is from there. But even Finnish, they have 54 groups. And we can see that some of these groups, as we highlight them and go down, they're only a fraction of that overall. And some of them start to get really small. Here's one that is really inside these other two groups. And it probably just contains, you know, a, a few cities in Finland um, that is for that. And again, you can see these groups can be really tiny. Let's go back to the English groups. Because you'll notice in the English groups, it also includes a lot of the ones that are in Canada and the United States because of the large immigrant population from there. Here, now these green ones are the ones that I belong to. So we're just looking at these other ones. So we have an Alabama group, which covers most of Alabama. And there's a second Alabama group, which covers a little bit into Georgia and Mississippi, as well as Florida. And then you can start to see some overlaps. But here, let's go up to Kentucky, Bretha, Kentucky. I believe that's probably just a county or maybe just a couple of counties in Kentucky. It's not that big. As we go down, let's take a look at some other Kentucky ones. Harlan, Kentucky, Johnson, Kentucky. You'll notice these are just really tiny areas of Kentucky that there is enough people that have tested and enough genetic diversity with other people in the database that they can isolate that your ancestors probably were in that area. Now, again, this isn't with everything, but you can see throughout the world, the different places that are just small fractions of it. So for instance, here is a group Taranaki in New Zealand. That's part of that English group that just takes up a fraction of New Zealand as well. So there is a lot of information to start to dive into with these genetic groups. And again, Remember, this is a combination of not just the DNA, 
but also the trees that people have developed as well. The advantage to this over the theory of family relativity is you don't have to have a tree to take advantage of this and you can actually use this to help isolate where some of your ancestors are from so maybe you're going to start to do some other searches that you weren't thinking of before. Now, as with many things that are related to the ethnicity estimates and that, remember these are estimates. Basically, there was a big cluster match done and you happen to show up in these clusters, but that is not 100% guarantee that you really belong to that. That's why they have the confidence level there. It's a high confidence, a medium confidence, a low confidence. But what it does do is it gives you a new tool to use so that you can further your genealogy research. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the theory of family relativity, then there's a video up here that you can watch. And if you want something else about DNA or my heritage, there's a video right here.